So this, just full disclosure, this is a presentation I give to instrument students. So some of this stuff I'm gonna skip over because I don't want to overfill your brains with stuff that you don't need right now. But the presentation we're gonna do is on navigational aids, AKA nav aids for short. And then we're also gonna talk a little bit about uh, emergency and survival gear. Uh, towards the end, I wanna get through this first because I think this is the most information heavy content for today. So we have something called nav aids because sometimes a map isn't enough, like just having a VFR sectional chart with you. If it's cloud coverage, low visibility, um, you're in unfamiliar airspace, you need navigational aids to help kind of direct where you're going. So there's different types of navigational aids. They kind of all work generally the same. Um, you have ground-based and space-based, so GPS is the only space-based one that we're going to talk about. And you have ground-based, which you have VORs, you have NDBs, which no one really uses anymore, but we will talk about it. Uh, VORs, NDBs are the main ones that you would especially use in your private pilot curriculum. And ultimately, for the ground-based, you have a ground-based component and then you have a receiver in the aircraft and that's pretty much how GPS works as well you have a satellite component and then you have a receiver in the aircraft so very similar in how they work and typically how they determine your position is they take the signal the time between the signal being sent and the time that the signal was received by the aircraft and then they find your position by measuring that time um, it's called trila trilateralization and yeah, they all kind of work that way, just to keep it super simple. So we'll talk about the different nav aids. Kind of went over that. Um, you got various systems on board and on the ground or in space. The ones we're going to talk about are VOR and DME, GPS and NDB. Uh, you can ignore ILS and localizer. That's an instrument flying thing. How they work, again, ground receiver or space receiver and an aircraft receiver. So VORs, okay. So ultimately what it stands for, the V is very high frequency. So it's, you know, the V is three words. And then OR is omnidirectional range. And that just means it's emitting signals in all, in all directions, 360 degrees. You have two signals that the VOR is emitting. You have a master signal and you have a variable signal. So the master signal, ultimately it stays in one spot. The variable signal rotates in 360 degrees. So kind of think of like a lighthouse with the light, you know, it spins all the way around. That's the variable signal. And then you have a master signal, which is also called a reference signal. So you have the signal that's omnidirectional and then you have the receiver in the aircraft. Basically kind of what's happening is you have the master signal and the variable signal variable signal at some point is received by the aircraft. And then the receiver in the aircraft measures the difference between the master and when the aircraft received it, and it finds your position that way. I like to explain VORs as like, imagine a bicycle spoke in the sky. You have a circle and then you have 360 different lines coming in at all directions. The components of a VOR, again, you have the ground base station and then you have the receiver in the aircraft. On, in the aircraft, your VOR is called an omnibearing selector. It has a two from indicator and a course deviation indicator, which are the needles. Those white needles are uh, CDI, course deviation indicator. And I'll show you a picture of it just so you know what it is. But I'll, I'll let you guys write what you like. Is that what you have to like you have to like kind of like set it at the beginning. You have to like turn yes. those over. Okay, so. Yep, yep, yep. And I'm gonna be honest. Under when it comes to reading and watching videos on VORs, for me personally, I did not fully understand how they worked until I flew using them. So a lot of this might not make a complete sense. But once hopefully we talk about it today, you actually go do VOR work during your flight training, and then you'll remember what we were talking about. You're like, oh my god, that makes sense. But talking about it is a little hard. So here's ultimately what they look like. There is one over at McClellan. So some airports have a VOR on the field. 
Um, but sometimes they're just randomly placed. I, I shouldn't say randomly, but sometimes they're, they're not always on a field. Like Sacramento, we have a VOR, but it's not located on an airport. It's just offset by itself. I also want to note that VORs are being decommissioned around the United States just because they're expensive to maintain, and now we have GPS. However, we are going to continue maintaining a certain amount of them. It's called the VOR min Minimum Operating Network. So we are keeping certain VORs because they're associated with like instrument approaches and departures and arrivals. So those are like VORs that we just can't get rid of because airliners, I feel like the main concern is the airliners. They still use VORs because yes, they have GPS, but they want to have a backup. The VOR is the backup. They look like those big white cones and here's your OBS in the plane. And those, these are your course deviation indicators, your CDI. And then up here, this little window, when you're on a VOR, it'll say to or from. And I'll kind of explain that on the next slide. So here's your imaginary bicycle spoke, right? We'll just pretend your master signal is like right up here. These are all of the variable signals. If you can just imagine that there's a bicycle spoke in the sky and there's a bunch of lines that your airplane will fly across, that is what intercepting is about. If you're intercepting one of those signals, that's the OBS will tell you what if you're on a to or a from indication. If you're going to the VOR, it's called a course, course inbound. If you're going away from the VOR, but you're intercepting one of these lines, that's called a radial. So radial radiating outwards. Think of it like that. So for example, here's your zero nine or zero, directly east pretty much. Oh, what is directly east? So you have a line going all the way and just extending, let's just say forever in theory. You have this line extending on an eastbound course or radial, depending on if you're going to or from. If you were flying away and you had intercepted this radial, when I say intercept, I mean the CDI needles are centered. If you have, so if you intercept a radial, it looks like that. The course is centered. Um, you'll have that, that, um, that vertical CDI. Once it's on the donut, you've intercepted the radial. If it was like offset right or left, that means you have to go right or left to intercept it if you're going to the station. When I say station, I mean to the VOR. If I'm flying to the VOR on zero, 09 or zero, that's a course. Oh, I'm sorry. If I'm on zero, 09 or zero, but I'm flying to the station, I'm probably roughly on a 270 heading ish. So I'm on a 270 course inbound. If I were intercepting 090 going away, then I'm on the 090 radial outbound. So radial outbound. Course is inbound. So I'm going to the station on a westbound course. I would be going away from the station on an eastbound course. If I were to intercept a radial down here, if I were flying away from it, I would be on the 135 radial outbound. Going this direction is 135. I'm going to the VOR. I'm going the exact reciprocal, 180 degrees, 315. So on the OBS, I would put 315 on top. You would get a two indication, and you would keep it centered and fly that way. If I wanted to go away from the station, I would twist it until uh, 135 was on top, and it would say from, and I would, could go away from the station. I do want to emphasize you can navigate the opposite. What I, what I mean by that is you can navigate to a station maintaining a 135 radio. One of the limitations of VORs is called reverse sensing. So normally when you're flying on a VOR you would have a two indication because you're flying to it and you would have your course inbound on top. So I would have 315 on top and saying two. And then I'm the donut and I follow the line to make sure that I'm on course. You could also fly to a station using the radial. So if I had 135 with a from indication, I can still go to the VOR using that setup. However, now I'm no longer the donut, I'm the needle. Does that make sense? 
Normally, if you're going to the station on a two indication, you're the donut. So you need to follow the needle. If the needle's over to the left, you need to turn to the left until it centers again, and then you keep it centered. If you're going to the station on a radial, it's the opposite. You're now the needle, and your course is the donut. So if the needle was over here, you would need to bring the needle back to the donut. So if the needle was to the left, you need to turn right. That confuses a lot of people. That is why we have GPS now, because reverse sensing can get people into a lot of trouble. It can get people lost. You can burn more fuel than you meant to that way. You can get disoriented that way, especially if you're flying in the clouds. Not so much of a problem when you're flying individual conditions because you can see if you're going the wrong way. But that's kind of one of the limitations of VORs. And another limitation is you can go direct to a VOR, but if the VOR is not at the airport that you're trying to go to, you kind of have to do like a zigzag pattern to get to the airport because what could be happening is like let's say, so here's Sacramento Executive, and then here's Sacramento VOR. So it's not on the field. So in order to get to Sacramento VOR, what you could do is you can find out what radial the Sac VOR is on, which here's your compass rows, and VORs are tuned to magnetic north, not true north. So all of these compass roses around different VORs might be slightly different. If I were to go to SAC exec using the SAC VOR, here's the airport, here's the VOR. This is roughly like, there's 030, 025, 020, 015. It's like a 015 radial from the station. And if I wanted to turn inbound to go to the station, I could take the reciprocal of 015 which would be down here. What's 015 plus 185? So I could fly a 195 course inbound to go to the station. And then how would you figure out like, when are you over the field? Well, other than seeing it, obviously you can see it if it's below you. What people used to have to do is they would use two VORs. So we would say, okay, I wanna go to the station and it's on a 015 radial from the SAC VOR. I would tune 015 on top with a from indication. I would find another VOR over here or over here or just somewhere nearby, which there is a VOR over here. You can see the compass rows. That's the Hangtown VOR over at Placerville. So what you could do, this is not like a great one. Here's a VOR it looks like. This is a little far, but it could work. So here's Skaggs Island VOR, right there. And you can find out like what radial is Sacramento Executive from Skaggs Island. So if I'm going to Sacramento, I'm just gonna guess and say it's like a 030, 035, 040, like a 045 radial going away from it. So I would on my second VOR, I would, I would tune it into Skaggs Island. I would tune 045 on top with a from indication. And then I will know that I'm over the station once both of those VORs are centered, once I'm over the airport. Because I've intercepted this radial and I've intercepted this radial. That's how they used to have to navigate. They have to, you know, it, it's ideal to have two VORs so you can intercept both of them to kind of pinpoint a location. So you have like a VOR over here and over here and you're intercepting those lines to somehow kind of like trilateral, I can't say that word. You can locate your position by intercepting two different VORs. So, let's see. It's like, okay, so here is where I'm trying to go. There's a VOR here, and let's say there's a VOR here. I'm just gonna guess that this is like a Three zero zero radial. I'm saying radial because I'm going away from the station. And then I'll say this is like one zero, yeah, one zero zero radial from this station. 
So the intersection between this radial and this radial is here, and that's where I want to go. Nowadays, I can just do direct to this airport and give me a straight line there. It's a lot more fuel efficient, a lot more time efficient, so GPS is a lot more uh, preferable, of course, with navigation. However, you still need to learn how to do VOR stuff because not every airplane you're going to fly has a GPS. Piper are built to fly. We don't have a GPS, but we do have VORs, so you can navigate using those. Obviously, you do have electronic flight bags like Core Flight um, that make it almost like you have a GPS on your iPad, but technically, this cannot be used as a primary means of navigation. However, it certainly does help, and it certainly um, comes in handy in the case of an emergency or like an electrical failure in the 150, for example. So it makes it really hard to be like, well, why would you learn how to use VORs? I have GPS, I have foreplay on my iPad and on my phone. But yeah, okay. But again, part of this is like, well, not every, not every airplane has a GPS, so learning how to use VORs is gonna be super helpful. And what if you have a GPS failure or GPS outage? Because that happens sometimes in different locations. The GPS could be have a scheduled outage that maybe you forgot to check for, and you can't use your GPS to get to navigate to wherever you're going to in that area. Now you have to use a VOR, and of course you do have uh, like electronic flight bag or like four flight, but you should always have a secondary means of navigation. Because technically four flight, again, cannot be used as a primary, because it's not installed into the aircraft. It's not certified for aircraft navigation. It is just a supplement. Do you want to ask him later? Huh? There's no person on like outside. Oh. No, I can't. He's just chilling on the front porch. Yeah. He like crouched down and like looked for the crack, but, and then like sat down. Is it a girl? Or no, it's a dude. Is he just lying there? Are you on? No. <laughs> I think he's just like laying down. He is? I don't know. I wonder why you're here. I guess maybe should we just wait to see if he leaves before the class ends? Tell me something. Trespassing on private property. Get off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, do we engage or no? <laughs> Are you sure? I'll be your backup. <laughs> oh, wait, did he leave? Did he leave? No, I think he's just laying down. spoke in the sky, a bunch of signals being emitted. You're, as you're flying close to a VOR, you are, if you're not tuned in, you wouldn't know, but you're intercepting all of those lines at some point. And if you're using them, then you would, whatever line you want to intercept, whether it's to or from, radial or course inbound, you would put that on top. And again, if it's a course inbound, it'll say to. If it's outbound, a radial, it'll say from, or FR for from. And you can navigate using that. So if you were flying and you wanted to go, like if the VOR is that plant and I wanted to go to it, 
but maybe I don't know what radial I'm on or what course I'm on, all I would have to do is tune in the navigational frequency, which is on the VFR section, I'll try it, will say it, and I'll show you. You would plug that in, you would identify it with Morse code reading, which again, I'll show you on the chart, I know it, I know it. <laughs> so you'll, you'll, you'll identify it to make sure that it's operational, because sometimes they're doing maintenance on the VORs, and if you don't hear the Morse code, that means that it's not operational, so it's not gonna work. I would tune in the frequency, I would identify it, make sure I got the right one, make sure it's operational, and then I would just twist the OBS knob until the needle's centered on a two indication, and then whatever number is on top, that's my course inbound. I'm saying course and not heading, because course is not the same thing as a heading, because if I have wind coming from that uh, simulator over there, my course inbound, let's just say my course inbound is 270, my heading could be 250, because I have a really strong wind and I'm crabbing, and I'm facing the wind to prevent it from pushing me off course. So my heading could be 250, but my track on the ground is still 270, I'm still going toward the station. So heading and course are not the same. However, you can use course as an initial heading to kind of get you on the right track. And then obviously, like if I'm like, you're, I'm maintaining like, you know, my 270 heading, but it says I'm off course. Okay, that probably means wind's pushing you off course. So you have to t turn in that direction. You're being pushed this way, you gotta turn the opposite way and start correcting for the wind. And you, it kind of just comes away by a feeling because if you're maintaining 270 on a heading, but the course starts deviating away from you, so it's moving to the left, that means you're to the right of the course, that means the wind's pushing you over to the right. So you need to turn to get back on the needle, and then if you are still going straight and then it happens again, you can you can guarantee the wind's pushing you off. So it's like, okay, instead of 270 on my heading, I'll do like a 260 heading to maintain the 270 ground track. Make sense? Flying sideways, ground track versus course versus heading. Again, 090 radial, if I'm going away, 270 course going inbound. Same thing down here, if I was right down here, but if I would say I'm going away from it, I could track the 180, 180 radial going away, or I could go to 360 to go towards it. And all of these are just imaginary, well, they're not imaginary, but they're, they're signals and they're lines radiating away from the station as you're flying, from like here, you're intercepting different radials all the way around it. You just don't know it if you're not tuned into it. So you wouldn't be aware unless you were trying to use the VOR. So when you're flying and using uh, VORs to navigate, you're looking for these compass roses because they always surround a VOR. Again, sometimes they're on airports, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just standalone. So if I were to do the Sacramento VOR, my frequency to put on the nav, so you know you guys tune in with the con frequency, so there's also nav frequencies, you would tune in the same way. You would tune in 115.2 on the nav one or nav two, and then usually to identify it, I think on the 150, you put it on nav one, which is on the GPS, and then you would hit the nav one button on the audio panel, so you know how you can see, you can hit the com one, com two buttons. There's also nav one, nav two buttons. So you have 1152, let's say on nav one on the GPS, and then you hit the nav one button on the audio panel. You would, you would turn up the volume for the navigation, and you would hear the beep, 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 beep. And you're like, okay, that's Sacramento. It's been identified, great. If you do not hear that after 30 seconds, then it's not operational for whatever reason. So you wouldn't be able to use it. So you'd have to find a different VOR nearby, which I think the closest one is probably, I think this is May 3rd, or Linden VOR. Linden VOR, okay. So there is Linden VOR, that's a standalone, it's not associated with an airport, so you can use Linden VOR as well. But again, these compass roses indicate that there's a VOR in the center, and they are oriented to magnetic north, not true. That's why all of them are like tilted a little bit differently. Because magnetic north, 
varies depending on what area of the world you're in. But same thing, tune in one on 4.8, nav one or nav two, identify it with the nav one or nav two button on the audio panel if you're listening for the Morse code. Cool, it's been identified. Make sure you got the right one. VOR kind of mentioned one is that reverse sensing. So it depends on if you're going to or from, whether you're the donut or the needle. Um, they're also limited by line of sight. So if there's a mountain in between you and the VOR and you're not high enough, you might not get a signal. They also get more sensitive as you get closer, which might sound like a good thing, but once you're like three miles away from the VOR, that needle gets increasingly very hard to follow. It just starts moving from side to side and people will try to chase it and then you're turning all over the place. Once you're within like three miles, which is called the cone of confusion, or the area of ambiguity, I've heard different terms, you kind of just have to pick a heading and do your best to go to the station. That's why they're limited, because it's like, well, they're not perfect. They're accurate because it's ground-based and it's fixed, but it's not like a GPS. It gets more sensitive as you get closer, it can get confusing, if you're in the clouds, it can become disorienting because you're trying so hard to keep the needle centered, but it's just too sensitive, so it's moving side to side and you're trying to chase it. Um, I would just, whatever heading you were on initially before it started going wild, I would just keep that heading. Um, there's also something called service volumes for VORs, and VORs have different service volumes. You have terminal, you have low, and you have high. All it means is like, for the high VORs, you can in, you can tune into those VORs up higher, and the higher you are, the farther away you can get a signal from it. The closer you, uh, the lower you are, the closer you have to be to get that signal because of line of sight. So if you have a terminal VOR, uh, I believe the limitation is you have to be, at least be a thousand feet, and the farthest away you can be to get it to get the signal is 25 nautical miles. Once you get into the low and the high. You still have to be at a thousand feet to get a reading, but it expands up to 40 nautical miles. And then as you get higher, it'll go to like 70 nautical miles, 100 nautical miles, 130 nautical miles as you get higher. So they have service volumes. So they're only certain heights and certain distances can you get a signal. But all of them start at a thousand feet. So if you're below a thousand feet and you're trying to get a signal, you're probably not gonna get one. GPS, we don't have that problem. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about uh, DME, distance measuring equipment. So a lot of the time, DMEs are co-located with the VOR. So it'll tell you how far away you are from a VOR. However, it's sometimes DMEs can be standalone without a VOR and they'll have their own frequency to tune into. You would tune it in the same way as a VOR. The limitation with DMEs is one, they are ground-based, so you have that um, line of sight limitation, once again. And also, it measures something called slant range distance, not your actual distance. So if you were at 5,500 feet and you were directly over a DME, it would say you're one mile away. So it takes your height above ground into account with your distance, which is a limitation, so it's not exactly precise. So that's that slant range distance. So once again, if I'm directly over the VOR, or the DME VOR, and I'm at 5,500 feet, that's, you know, a mile is 5,280 feet or something. It's gonna say you're a mile away, even though I'm right over it. Uh, so the rule of thumb to avoid the slant range limitation is for every mile you are away from the DME, you should be at 1,000 feet. So if I'm one mile away from the DME, I should be at 1,000 feet. That way it'll still say, it'll say one and it won't take into account my altitude so much, it'll be negligible. If I'm two miles away, I should be at 2,000 feet. If I'm three miles away, I should be at 3,000 feet and so on and so forth. Same thing, you have a ground-based receiver and an aircraft receiver. And again, it's usually associated with a VOR and they show the same frequency. 
I can't think of an example, but again, some sometimes they're they're solo and it's just a VOR. The symbol on um, on the VFR sectional chart is just a box. You just see a box. Um, I believe it's a box and it'll have a compass rose around it. That's just the DME. There's different symbols though for what is this? Site range, plan of site, the workload. Um, I'm just going to be simple. GPS eliminates a lot of the workload because you don't have to, like with the VOR, once you intercept like two VORs, for example, to find like a certain checkpoint and you want to go to the next checkpoint, now you got to find two different VORs or you at least have to tune to a different radial for those two VORs. So there's a lot more tuning and identifying and changing frequencies, whereas the GPS is like, you could just go straight there and you only have to dial it in one time. The workload is a big thing. Um, I think I'll, I was gonna show you guys some symbols, but I think that's later on, okay. I'll talk about NDBs. NDBs are becoming irrelevant. They're pretty much irrelevant already, but we're gonna talk about it. Um, so NDB stands for non-directional beacon. So I told you guys that VORs are on the directional, an NDB is non-directional. How they work, same thing. You got a ground receiver and you have a receiver in the aircraft called an ADF, automatic direction finder. These are what we used before VOR, so they're even older. And they're a lot less, uh, you, you see them a lot less frequently, but they do still exist. So in terms of an NDB versus a VOR, the way I like to explain it is when you drop a pebble in water, it produces ripples. An NDB, you would find out, if you drop the pebble in the water and you see the ripples, you can kind of get a general idea of where the pebble was dropped in direction by looking at where the ripples are coming from. And then you can kind of turn in that general direction and go toward it. That's kind of how an NDB works. It's just a general direction and you have to do the, a lot of calculation. It just points in the, in the bearing of the station in relation to your location. So like, if I'm facing this way and the NDB is that plant, and let's say you're north. So you are north, so that means that this is east because it's off my right. What it's gonna say is that this plant is on an east of, Easter, easterly bearing from me. It's somewhere off of my right. That doesn't mean it's on like, it's not like a zero nine or zero radial per se. It's just saying, hey, it's somewhere off your right. If you turn to your right somewhere, you'll eventually find it. So what you do is you take your magnetic heading, you add your relative bearing, whatever it's reading, and I don't have a picture of one because you don't have one on the plane. So, you know, we don't even really need to worry about NDB operations per se, but I don't want this to be like a foreign concept to you. But in order to get to a non-directional beacon, you would have to take your magnetic heading, add the relative bearing, which was like zero, 09 or zero. That was, your, that was my bearing, not radial, but my bearing. Just saying, hey, it's somewhere off your right. And then you'll get your magnetic bearing and that's what you would kind of use as a heading. Then you have to correct for wind, and it's a lot of calculation. It's not like it's not like a GPS where it's just like, hey, where the needle is pointing, that's where you go. It's the needle's pointing that way, but you need to take your heading into account. You need to add the two to get your magnetic bearing, and then if the wind is pushing you off, that might change it too. So I was like, okay, what the hell? So because I could be facing this way because the wind is coming from here and I'm going that way. But my magnetic heading is this way. My ground track is that way. And then the bearing is still saying, hey, it's somewhere off to your right because all I can see is my magnetic or my uh, ground track. So now you have an even bigger difference that you have to calculate, you have to account for. We don't use these anymore. Um, it, just, it just always points to the station. And it's just, it's not accurate. It is less expensive to maintain than a VOR, and it's not so limited by line of sight, but it can be affected by weather. So if it's like 
a showery, rainy day, you might not pick up the signal. VORs, they're not limited by weather. Um, so NDBs. Ground-based. Uh, you navigate to the NDB simply by pointing the aircraft in the direction of the arrow. It's not a heading or anything, but it is like, hey, it's somewhere that way. Track that way, see what happens. Um, and it's not like a straight line to the station. It kind of is more like an arc pattern. So when I say like an arc, so if this is the NDB, the air, and so the arrow will be pointing to that station. I could turn to that station, and then the relative bearing is going to change. And okay, now it's in front of you, and like so, you can you know. Then the wind pushes you off, and then the bearing's like, hey, now it's over here. So you kind of have to arc your way around it versus going directly to it, like with a VOR or with a GPS. So it's inefficient. It's even more inefficient than a VOR because it's just always pointing to the station. So if I'm you going this way, it'll just be like, okay, now it's kind of like behind you, it's somewhere behind you, off your left. Yeah, and that's all I wanted to say about the NDB. Relative bearing. So here's some rules that you can see on the VFR section chart. So we just have a VOR. It's a hexagon. One, two, three, four, five, six. No, hexagon. 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 Um, if it's a VOR with a DME, this has a box. A Vortac. That is a cross between a VOR and a TACAN. TACAN is like the military version of a DME. So if it's a Vortac, it has a VOR DME plus a TACAN. We cannot tune into those, it's military only. But you can tune into the VOR DME portion of it, just not the TAC hand portion of it. NDB, again, you'll rarely see this. Um, there are, there's maybe like five in the continental US, and I do believe there's one, I think in Honolulu. But they're not very common. Um, and there's a couple like in different continents as well. And there are still some instrument approaches based off of NDBs, not that you would be doing any of them. They're just very far and few between. Or few and far, whatever that saying is. Uh, VOR, more precision, more accuracy, not affected by weather, less workload, because again, with the NDB, it's like, okay, what's the relative bearing? What's my magnetic heading? Okay, what's my magnetic bearing? How do I correct for the wind with this? However, you can, it's inexpensive to maintain. You can get it at lower altitudes. And it's not um, limited by line of sight. So it's not limited by terrain, but it is limited by weather. <coughs> oh, I should put that in the graphics as well. That's instrument stuff. We're not talking about. Okay, GPS. We all know what GPS is. <coughs> Phones have it, our cars have it. Satellite-based versus ground-based, so VORs is ground-based, DME is ground-based, GPS is satellite-based, that's why it's more accurate. Um, so global positioning system, you have a constellation of 31 satellites. The way the GPS is developed, um, you'll have at least five in, in sight at any time or within uh, your receiver at any time. It's more accurate in terms of your position. Because it's not limited by line of sight, it's not limited by weather, and it has something called RAIM, which is Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. So if there is an error in the calculations of the GPS, it'll correct itself. It's a lot smarter than a VOR. And what was that last word? Uh, receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. <coughs> so the GPS will correct for itself if it's not accurate, if it detects an error. Um, one limitation of GPS is sometimes there are scheduled outages, which usually there will be a notum for that, which you can find on four flight. But they're very rare.
We have GPS in the 150. That's the Garmin uh, 530. So there's and there's different types of GPS um, systems. The most popular for general aviation is Garmin. There's other companies though. You'll find it too. There's like Avidyne. There's Honeywell. Um, there's a couple others. There's Dynan, I think, is another one. Garmin's the most popular. Garmin kind of just dominates the market. But you know, G the GPS is the whole like direct to function. You can just go direct to an airport. You don't need a VOR. You don't need a, God forbid, an NDV. And it's just a lot more accurate because it's constantly calculating your position a lot faster than like, you know, the ground based is very, it's limited to just what your aircraft can do and what the ground based station can do. The ground based station is fixed. The satellite can calculate and constantly change and correct itself. And if one satellite is, um, I don't know, goes out, it'll replace it with another satellite because there's 31 that we know of up in the sky. And GPS used to be military only, and then it made its way to the airlines, and then it obviously has made its way into general aviation, but it's still fairly new. When I say fairly new, I mean like, it became popular in general aviation within the last like 20 years. Um, you have two types of augmentation for GPS. You have WAS, Wide Area Augmentation System, and then you have non-WAS, which is just, it, it does not have WAS. With WAS, a simplified way of putting it is it just so with WAS you have not only the space based portion, but there's also a ground based portion. You have these master stations, is what they're called, on the ground, and they just provide more accurate uh, calculations and errors. They correct for it, and then they send it back to the aircraft. Non-WAS does not have those extra ground base stations, so it still, you know, still calculates for errors and corrects, but not to the level of a WAS, of a WAS GPS. On top of that, not really relevant for you guys, but for instrument flying, it gives us an, an additional type of approach which is very useful because it provides us a very accurate, I don't wanna like go too, far, too much into it, but it, um, it provides an, an extra instrument approach that would be available to you, which is useful because if you're doing instrument flying and you're flying on and you're going to an airport, the more approaches that are available, the better, just in case one of your navigational system fails, you have another one. And what WAS does is it provides us another approach that gets us lower. So if you're stuck in the clouds and in the fog, you might break out a little bit lower. And that's what WAS does. It gives us an approach that we can get even lower accurately without hitting anything. That's the approach I was talking about. I'm not gonna go too much into it. Um, we have talked about ADSC before. Automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. Automatic because the aircraft automatically does it. Dependent, it's dependent on if the aircraft is equipped with WAS and an ADSB transmitter. Surveillance, because it allows ADC to watch us. It's like radar, but more accurate. And then broadcast, it broadcasts your position. When I say it's more accurate than radar, I just mean radar, I don't know the exact number, but radar updates and corrects for your position every like, let's just say 15 seconds. ADSB does it every second. ADSB was mostly formulated for air traffic control because what it does, because you have more accurate position reporting, they can decrease the separation between airplanes. They can get traffic flowing a lot more efficiently and a lot um, at a greater volume and safely with ADSB. ADSB became a requirement for all aircraft, including general aviation, in January of 2020. So we do have ADSB in both planes, the 150 and the Piper. And if you have in that white box in the 150 and in the Piper, that's an ADSB receiver, which if you connect to it on four flight, it allows you to pick up traffic on four flight as well. So that's why it's nice to have one of those sentries in the plane. Because on the, in the 150, the Garmin 
does not have traffic capability. So like you have the GPS and everything, but there are some GPS where you could actually see like other aircraft too. Can't do that on the 150. But if you have the Sentry and you have four flight, you can connect to that uh, via Wi-Fi, then you have the speed receiver um, like supplement, and then you can see traffic on four flight, which is super helpful. Not required, but very helpful. That was it for nav aids. GPS. I think I've been throwing around the word integrity with GPS. Integrity means um, the usability of the satellite signal and the ability of like of the system to provide correction for error. So that's what I mean when I say GPS integrity. WAS just has a higher integrity than non-WAS. I believe. Do we have a WAS on the I want to say we have a non-WAS GPS which might not really mean anything to you guys because you're not doing instrument approaches right now. And honestly, like you don't really notice a difference until you start doing instrument stuff between WAS and non-WAS because then it's like, oh, I have another approach now. But because we're not doing an instrument approach, it doesn't really matter. Cool, so that was it for those, um, for the nav aids. Does anyone have any questions on the nav aids right now? Um, when you guys, get to that phase of flying, which is usually phase two, your cross country stuff. Um, highly recommend doing VOR work for your CFI. It's required anyway, but um, it's just one of those things that, at least for me and for like other students and other people I've talked to, VORs kind of take a little bit to get used to and to use and to kind of fully understand the concept of them. So do it as much as it takes for it to make sense and for you to comfortably use it to navigate somewhere if you needed to. Um, and I'm gonna say it, it might not mean anything to you right now, but if you were just to navigate to the VOR and you didn't have a particular radial or course that you wanted to intercept, all you would do is tune into that VOR, twist the OBS needle until it centers, and then go in that direction. And it'll take you right to the VOR as long as you keep the needle centered. Once again, once you get close to it, it's sort of gonna start going wide, it'll just maintain that same same course. I wanted to show you guys a video. So part of the, one of the tasks of the ACS that you'll be tested on is radio communications, navigation systems, slash facilities, and radar services. So radar services just mean like if you're getting on a flight following, ATC is providing you radar services, AKA they can see you on their radar and they're tracking you. And if you have an emergency, you're already talking to them so you can declare an emergency. If you're not using ATC, you would have to either find the nearest facility around you, which can be hard to do when you're stressed out because of like an engine failure or something, or you use the emergency frequency 121.5, and there's kind of like a middleman somewhere in between there, so it's not as efficient, because airliners, they monitor 121.5 as they're flying, and if they hear you, they'll be like, hey, here's somebody saying mayday, mayday, mayday. They'll tell ATC 
hey, someone's transmitting on 121.5, and then HC has to figure out where you are and figure out what air traffic control facility is near you. And there's just, there's a lot of like middleman work. Whereas if you're on a flight following, you can talk to someone directly. Part of it is like the applicant is able to identify, assess, and mitigate risks associated with when to seek assistance or declare an emergency in a deteriorating situation and using your available resources. Um, the examples are automation, ATC, and flight deck planning aids. Automation, we don't have autopilot, we do have GPS. So GPS, there is a function called the nearest function. Um, have your seat I show you. But you can, the GPS will identify the nearest airports if you're not familiar where you are. Um, you can go to the nearest page and it'll be like, here's an airport that's two miles away from you. And you could just select that airport, hit direct, enter, enter, and it'll take you directly to that airport. Flight deck management aids. Um, I mean, your checklist is one, obviously, because it's, you know, you have an engine failure, run through the checklist, figure out how you could possibly restart the engine, figure out what you need to do if you need to just do an emergency landing. But when to seek assistance or declare an emergency, I feel like is people struggle with that. They don't know when they should. To put it bluntly, if you're not sure if you're gonna live or die, you declare an emergency. It, you might not necessarily be an emergency, but if you're just not sure and you just need all, you need ADC to prioritize you and you need them to focus on getting you to the ground, then you declare. Um, this guy, he kind of declares an emergency at first, and then ATC is like, okay, are you declaring an emergency? And he's like, actually not at this time, because I don't want to do the paperwork. <coughs> and it's like, okay, who cares about the paperwork? There actually might not even be any. It, that's kind of a myth. It's like, it's not, they might not necessarily need you to fill out anything. It depends on what happened. But that aside, who cares? You can figure that out on the ground. If you need ATC to help you, then you declare and you use them. Um, complying with ATC instructions. Another thing, in complying with ATC instructions, they can't fly the plane for you and they might, there was, a, there was another flight where, which I think is another video that I can show you, they, um, this guy was at 4,000 feet and he was having engine trouble. Not a failure, but a definite decrease in RPMs that were not in his control, and a drop in oil pressure. Um, and he was at 4,000 feet, and he was like two miles or something away from an airport. ATC told him to send and maintain 2,500, and he said negative. So I'm gonna maintain 4,000 until I have the airport in sight, and then I'll descend at my discretion. That's the authority you need to use. I'm not descending when I have enough, al I have a perfectly good amount of altitude to glide even farther if I needed to, whereas if I go lower, I have less options. So ATC thinks that they're helping sometimes, but sometimes they can say things that are not helpful at all. So you have to be able to filter through what they say and figure out what is useful for you and what's actually gonna help you and what's gonna hurt you. If you're up higher, you have more options. If they tell you to descend, it's like, no, not until I'm for sure gonna make that airport or I'm gonna for sure make that field. Um, I, feel like they, I think they gave him a vector to something as well, and he was like, negative, I'm going direct to this airport. I think they were trying to give him another airport that was farther away, and he was like, negative, There's, that's the one, I'm going direct to that airport. And they can't argue with you, because they can't fly the plane for you. So comply with ATC instructions to a point. Don't let them fly the plane.
That's it, I didn't bother. They're four five. Yellow plane is in the line. Is that correct? Uh, negative on 911. I think we're going to be okay. Uh, for the first time I've ever been in this situation. 65045, Roger. Just uh, uh, no delays in here. And you are just very nervous here. So he actually changes his mind. Take a little while because uh, then I know there's lots of paperwork. Yeah, so it's like, that's just, he should have just stuck with it. So you continue on the line with. Let me know if you'd like one eight. The winds are out of the west northwest right now. They are heading, turning north at night. Roger, coming in for one eight for zero four five. Zero four five. If you'd like one eight, we can work that out. Let me know, or if you fly direct to the airport, let me know which runway you need. Roger, that direct to the airport. I'll let you know. Zero four five. Look now, it's at seven zero three hundred two four miles. Energy base to two. You have a south and a north runway, and you have a west and east runway. There's a real fast carrier structure to fly south and east south to present position. That's technically about to the northwest. That's west to about three miles. There's the emergency to go south and east south to present position and south to the first side. Fly south and east south, and you uh, are direct the airport, so we'll call you over the airport. 045, I have that. It's declaring emergency. We'll have the responding equipment. And 045, Rocky, continue inbound. And uh, report uh, what you can do there. You can make runway 18 or what would you like. When this press, please 2506. We'll try 18. That's going to be the closest for me for 045. 045, Rocky. Runway 18, and you'll be number two for the airport. Traffic snow factory, short final for two steps. Runway 1 8 back there to land uh, number 2, 045. So, stop safe to hold on board if you wish for me when you have time and take your test. Uh, test at 152, uh, 1 pro, and uh, approximately uh, 30 camels of fuel. Interesting. Don't think I'm going to make it, 045. 045, but you continue, just continue, and let me know. For us at that time, uh, 10 RPMs down to 1500, getting a lot of knocking now. Engine out, 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 I'm going to set it out on that turn to 2,300 depending. Did I miss some of that? Did you said maybe 65? Is that correct? Right? Uh, I don't know the highway number we're coming up here, but uh, a lot less traffic, uh, two lane highway, or sorry, four lane highway. Okay. Well, let's keep going to read as long as you can to the 045. Let's keep it much. You do what you have to. Roger, 045. The Hoka Tower, 05 here, we're over here today, I think. 05 here, that's just too. Uh, Continue orbiting east of the field. Alright, we're orbiting on the end of uh, 27 there right here. 70392, let's uh, turn left there, clear up, uh, go south of Bravo and then hold and then just Captain clear back. Aircraft on the ground. South of Bravo, hold and stand by. Everybody calling ground control radio discipline, please stand by for about three minutes. Same radio discipline because everyone's talking, trying to talk to him while he's in an emergency, so he's like, all y'all need to wait. Canada Tower, there's other there, but here, anyway, to get a visual on that 165. He was at north, so he was at northwest, he was going east on the slope. He was on some highway way up north, but he was on the street of the past four miles. Northwest, there, you go north from there if you like. 
you know, he can direct you to a runway or the nearest airport, but if you can't make that, then there's really nothing else that they can do other than like, I'll keep you on radar contact as long as I can um, so that he can get his position or her position. And then I think the pilot did a nice job because he was, you know, he was going for the airport because naturally, but he realized I'm not gonna make it. So I'm gonna look for another option. And ABC kind of came back and was like, you can do one runway 18, you can do runway 18. And he was like, I'm not gonna make it. I'm going on the freeway. So I think everyone did a great job. Thankfully, no one was hurt on the freeway. Um, thankfully, the pilot uh, survived. And this other guy that was down here, he what he was doing is he was offering to go and get a more um, accurate position by flying over. But um, everything seemed to work out. Thankfully, the pilot was still able to contact the tower even from the ground. Um, that's not guaranteed. Sometimes if you're on the ground, if there's enough terrain, you might not be able to contact ATC from the ground, but thankfully he was able to. Um, if that's the case, usually uh, like on four flight, for example, there will be a phone number depending on your location. So what I would do, you know, for example, let's just pretend Let's pretend we had to land off the airport somewhere around uh, Lincoln. Now there's a bunch of fields over here. So let's say we have an off airport landing at Lincoln. I would either look over at Lincoln or Sacramento, just a nearby airport, but we'll say Lincoln. I would look at Lincoln, I'd go to info, and then I would look for a phone number to call, kind of like any phone number. So like you could call flight service with this number and you can be like hey you know what's this six one three two nine or i just declared an emergency i am you know two miles west of lincoln airport and uh i was on with norcal on this frequency could you let them know that i am on the ground and i'm okay and here's my location and the flight service can can take that information and give it to and call norcal and let them know because uh, there's not oh no yeah you also have this number too um Sometimes this isn't there though. But if this is clearance delivery, that's NorCal Approach. You can call that phone number and talk to NorCal Approach directly and be like, hi, I was the emergency aircraft, 61329er. I'm on the ground, I'm two miles west of Lincoln. Give them an approximate location. Uh, that guy uses phone GPS, which is really smart. And just tell them like you're on the ground, you're safe. Uh, aircraft's not on fire, or if the aircraft is on fire, <laughs> you need, you know, you need a fire department out here, all those things. But that's just a way to go and find uh, a phone number to call if you cannot access them from the ground on a frequency. And I would probably just save this phone number in your phone. Honestly, that way, um, I don't know if like a four flight wasn't working or if you just don't have four flight, you don't have access to it, then you at least have the phone number. For NorCal approach, you know, obviously, like if you're in Southern California and something happens, you have to contact SoCal approach or whoever. But just to have somebody to call, um, flight service is always the same phone number. It's 1 800 Weather Brief, WX Brief, or this phone number here. You can save that one in your phone too. Hopefully, something you'll never have to. But in the case that you have to call from the ground off the airport because of an emergency landing, it would just be helpful if you could communicate to somebody. All right, we were also going to talk about um, emergency equipment in the plane. Um, we talked about the ELT, so every plane has that. Emergency locator transmitter, it is programmed to go off at a certain amount of Gs being pulled at certain impact, aka it can crash or if you land too hard. Sometimes it goes off if you land really hard, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but it'll, it'll set to go off, and you're just like a flashing beacon on a radar for ATC. That being said, there's a lot of false ELTs going off because, unfortunately, when people install ELTs, they don't pay attention to the regulations where you're only allowed to set them off to test them within the first five minutes of the hour. So if you hear an ELT going off, if you're on Abiclellan and you're 
on the CTAP frequency, if an, if an ELT is strong enough, you'll hear it on the CTAP frequency. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't know what's going off unless you tuned into 121.5. However, some people ignore that rule and they test them whenever they want. So sometimes they'll be going off and ADC won't do anything because they're like, it's probably a false one. So if the ELT is going off, if it's going off for 24 hours straight, then they're going to start worrying. But otherwise, they might not get to you immediately. So there is that limitation, unfortunately, with the ELT. That's why it's useful to be communicating to NorCal or to whatever ADC facility is nearby. Um, it's located in the back of the plane because the back of the plane is most likely to survive a crash. Because obviously, if you crash, usually the nose hits first. So it'll, it'll survive the crash, it's located in the back. Um, so that's one thing that all the planes have. Uh, I don't believe we have it in the 150, but fire extinguishers always, if there's a fire extinguisher, make sure the pressure's in the green. If, it, the, if it's out, uh, if the gauge is out of it, then you need a new one. Um, you should have a general idea of how to operate a fire extinguisher. You know, you take out the pin, you aim at the base of the fire, you use the sweeping motion, and then you squeeze together the two handles to make it go. Aim, again, aim at the base of the fire, which if it's in the engine, obviously hard to do when you're flying the plane. So if you have a passenger, if you have a passenger do it. Um, otherwise, your priority is to get the airplane down, not necessarily to put out the fire. So I wouldn't say to prioritize that part unless you have someone who is able to do it. Um, if it's an electrical fire, it's usually coming from the panel, so you aim it at the panel. Um, otherwise, if it's, if it's on fire and you're on the ground, just get out. You know, the plane is, it's done. Just get out. You're not, we're not firefighters, okay? Like, get out of the plane. Um, it's also important to note, because I didn't know this until recently, if you use a fire extinguisher, uh, it most likely, some of them, I think you just have to, if you use it, but not use it like all of it, and there's still some remaining, some of them you just have to throw away. Well, not throw them away because they're hazardous, so you have to dispose of them properly. But you have to dispose of it, or you have to get it recharged, which you could do that like at a fire department. You could call the local fire department and be like, are you, I don't know, could you recharge or refill fire extinguishers? So if you use them, you can't just like put them back. You have to go recharge them. Um, yeah, I don't think we have one in the 150 though, so there's nothing for that. Um, other gear that you would need to worry about having is if you're going to go, like, let's say fly to the Bay Area or fly over water, if you're flying an airplane for hire, aka you're flying with a flight instructor, if you fly over water and you are outside of gliding distance from the shore, so if you're at 2,000 feet and you're five miles away from the shore, you're not within gliding distance because this airplane glides about nine to 10 miles for every mile up in the air you are. So if you're at 5,500 feet, engine out, you could glide about 10 miles in theory. If you're at 10,000 feet, you can glide about two, uh, 20 miles in theory. If you're at 2,000 feet, you can glide, you know, maybe five miles. So if you're, you know, six miles at 2,000 feet, you're outside of gliding distance, you have to have a flotation device on board for everybody life jackets, for example. Um, so keep that in mind if you ever fly to, to the barrier with like a flight instructor. Just know you cannot be outside of gliding distance from the shore unless you guys have flotation devices, which I know we do not have in the planes unless you bring your own. Um, another option would be like a raft, which is are very expensive and very large, so probably not those either. Anything else? Carbon monoxide detectors, those sentries, the white boxes in both of the planes, those are carbon monoxide detectors. So when they're connected to four flight, um, if there's a carbon monoxide detection in the plane, four flight, like a voice will pop up in your headset and it'll let you know, like, warning, carbon monoxide detected at, I don't know, whatever the unit is. Um, I would get down as soon as practical, you know? Um, if you're doing maneuvers, cut the maneuver short, go land back at McClellan, get out of the plane open the air vents. Um, if the cabin heat is on, turn it off because the cabin heat is drawing filtered hot air from around the engine. And if there's an exhaust leak, then that air around the engine is now contaminated and that's probably where the carbon monoxide is coming from. So you turn off the cabin heat, open the vents, you can even open the windows if you're you know, going inside. 
In the 150, you can probably open it any time if you don't know about that. But um, I wouldn't open the windows above like 90 miles per hour. So slow down, open the windows, you know, air out the cabin, basically what you're trying to do. Other emergency equipment, depending on the airplane, if you're flying a Cirrus, you got a parachute. I don't know how those work. I know there's a button that you press. I don't know the parameters for that, so I'm not gonna go into it, but a parachute is another one. If you're flying an appropriate aircraft, we do not have parachutes. So that's not an option. Um, yeah, that's all the survival gear I can think about. Um, so when you're going on cross countries, I tend to think a little bit more paranoid. So usually with a cross country, um, if the flight school has one, I'll bring a handheld radio just in case something were to happen. And I could always, if we had a lost comm issue or if we had to land and we can't use the plane to communicate, I have a radio. Um, other things to bring, snacks, water, especially water nowadays. It's really hot. Um, I have like an emergency like survival kit and it has like fire starters, it has emergency blankets in it, um, it has a signal in here that I learned how to use, just things like that. It might sound like a little paranoid, but you just never know. If you're going on a long cross country, you never know what's going to happen. You have to land off an airport somewhere, you have to survive somewhere overnight, let's just say for 24 hours. You should just bring something along with you where you could survive a 24 hour unplanned camping trip if you needed to. Just things to think about. Um, people might look at you like you're crazy and you're paranoid, but hey, if something were to happen, you're going to be glad that you brought some stuff. So you can just buy a typical survival kit off of Amazon or something. Just something that if you can fit it in your flight bag, that'd be great. Um, but always bring water on your flights. Um, always bring, like, just have a snack, have some food. You just never know. Um, yeah, I've just, I've met pilots that because they had to do something like that, they never go flying without their emergency kit. Even if it's just local, they always bring it because it happened to them. So now it's at the forefront of their mind. Hasn't happened to any of us, thankfully. Hopefully it never does. So we might not be thinking about it all the time, but you never know until it happens, and then you'll be glad that you had something on you, band-aids, things like that. That's why I always bring my flight bag with me. You'll see some instructors, like, they'll leave their bag, but they'll just take their headset. I don't do that. I'm just like, I'm paranoid, whatever, but I have snacks, I have water, and I can survive for 24 hours if I need to do. thing I wanted to say is there was kind of some miscommunication between like I'm declaring an emergency are you declaring an emergency affirmative I'm declaring an emergency okay are you declaring an emergency I'm gonna hold off on that for a while because I don't want to fill the paperwork okay whatever um, if I'm declaring an emergency I'm first of all you stick to it you just stick to it and just so there's no confusion instead of saying I'm declaring an emergency I would just say mayday 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 that is universal language for like, this is an emergency. And also it gets people's attention. Because if you just get on there, you say mayday, everyone stops. But if you get on there and you're just like, you're a Cal approach, or I'm declaring an emergency. They might not, honestly, they might not hear you. You might get stepped on. Um, they might need clarity and you're wasting precious time confirming with them for the third time that you are indeed declaring an emergency. If you say mayday, mayday, mayday three times, then Everyone knows you're declaring an emergency, there's no questions asked. So just something that's a little more clear and concise could save you precious time and energy to communicate to ABC. They know it, they're not gonna waste your time asking three different times if you're declaring or not. Um, additionally, on the transponder, you'll squawk 7700, just so everyone knows you're an emergency aircraft. And ATC can see that you're an emergency aircraft. There's three different squat codes that you should be aware of. 7700 is an emergency. 7500, you're being hijacked. Hopefully that doesn't happen. That'd be really weird if it happened like on a flight lesson. 
Um, so 7500, hijacking. 7600 is a lost communication. So you're unable to hear or transmit on the radio. This goes without saying, but try your best to not accidentally squawk one of those things. What if you're doing like a flight following with someone? You know, they might be like, I can't think of anything that they'd act, they'd be, that, that they would give you that you would accidentally end up squawking one of those. But just be very mindful of when you're changing the squawk code that you're not accidentally passing through 7700 or 7600. Usually the squawk codes don't usually begin with seven because they want to avoid that whole fiasco happening, but just be mindful of it. And in terms of just like emergency preparation, all you can do is practice this with your CFI during your flight lessons. All you can do is, you know, chair fly the emergency procedures when you're not flying, just because if you don't have the muscle memory, you don't have the flow, then you're not going to have it when you need it. So always be fresh on emergency procedures. Always be fresh on, if you're going to go fly a different airplane for the first time and you're going to get checked out like in a 172 or just whatever aircraft, Try to find that checklist online or get a picture of it from the flight school and go over all of the procedures for the emergency stuff. Because when I do aircraft checkouts for people, like if they if somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, I have a lot of 150 time, but I don't have any time on 172. I want to get checked out on 172. Okay. What I make them go through is I make them go through stalls. I make them go through steep turns. I make them do... Um, pattern work a lot, like different landings, short field, soft field landings, power off landings, and I make them do an emergency procedure. So if it's a 172, it will say we're doing maneuvers, I'll cut the engine and I'll be like, where would you go? Because I want to make sure that they know how to operate this airplane, a 172, and use the appropriate procedures for this type of airplane versus a 150. Now, they're very similar in terms of checklists, so it's not that big of a difference between the two, but there's other aircraft that they can get checked out in. And if you're in an aircraft that has retractable landing gear, then you have to go, you should go through a procedure with a CFI on how to manually lower the gear if you had like an electrical failure. So for aircraft checkouts, most people, most CFIs will test you on emergency procedures. So you want to stay fresh on those for aircraft checkouts. And obviously if anything were to ever happen, it's always fresh in your mind. You've been training through it. You're proficient with the emergency procedures. You'll definitely be tested on emergencies during your check ride. It could be in the traffic pattern, it could be over a field. And a lot of the time examiners will put you over an airport to see if you even recognize that you're over an airport and they'll cut your engine and they'll be like, where would you go? And then you're like, I'm gonna go land on that road over there. And they're like, there's an airport right below you. So always look to make sure there's, if there's an airport. Look on four flight if you have four flight, look on your GPS, uh, look for the airport symbol look with your eyes because obviously the airport is the preferred choice if you ever land but running through the checklist chair flying the checklist because so it all becomes muscle memory you know what you're doing um, which we talked about in one other lesson prior is I use the ABC checklist as a flow so a airspeed best glide aka fly the plane your first priority is always to fly the plane Finding a place to land is the second thing to do, and then communicating the ABC is the third thing to do if you have time, if you have the bandwidth to do it. So airspeed, best glide. B, best place to land, hopefully an airport or a field or uh, an empty highway. And the C is the restart checklist. So restart checklist, you're basically just looking through, like if it's an engine failure, what kind of things can cause engine failures? What do we know? What could cause an engine failure? based on what you know. Oil leak. What's that? Oil leak. Oil leak, for sure. What do we need to fly? Yeah. You need yeah. gas. Yeah. Yeah. Could have, you know, I've seen people take off, the gas cap flies off, and then you lose gas that way. Or some people just don't calculate fuel burn accurately, so they have fuel um, starvation. So you could have fuel starvation, you could have an oil leak, 
get the carburetor icing if it's a carbureted engine. Any of those things could happen. You can have a mixture that's just too rich. If you're up high and it's hot and you have mixture all the way in, there's too much fuel going into the engine and there's not enough air to counteract it. So you could literally be flooding the engine and um, what's the term? The spark plugs, they can't combust because it's, it's almost like there's too much liquid. So spark plugs can't combust, you flooded the engine because it's too rich. So what you're doing with the restart checklist is you're checking all of those things. You're making sure the fuel is on, first of all. If you have the mixture all the way in and you recognize I'm at 7,000 feet and it's hot outside, maybe I should lean the mixture. That might be all you need to do when the engine restarts. You check the mixture, turn on the carb heat because you could have carburetor icing, you just turn it on no matter what. Um, and then you check to make sure the magnetos are on. They're on both, preferably. And then you make sure the primer's in and locked. Because the primer, if it sneaks out, it could be injecting fuel into the cylinders and then you have uh, the issue of the mixture being too rich because now you have too much fuel in the cylinders. Make sure all of those are where they should be. And if you just adjusted something, like if you just changed something and then the engine failed, undo what you just did. If you're at altitude and you leaned in the mixture, maybe you leaned it too much. Then the engine starts to quit. Okay, undo that, put the mixture back in. But if you didn't do anything, then you go through the flow, which I start from the ground, I go up and then to the door. So that's the C. The D is dialogue or declare. So declare an emergency, squawk 700, if you have time. If you're at 2,000 feet, you might not have time to do all of this. That's fine, by the way. So this is only if you have time. So you declare an emergency, mayday, 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 61329er, engine failure, I'm landing two miles west of Lincoln. And if that's all you're able to say, then that's all you're able to say. The ATC will get with you, they'll be like, if you can, advise how many souls are on board and how much fuel you have on board. If you can't get there, then that's fine. Just fly the plane. Um, so you have checklist, you have declare, and then A, B, C, D, E, e is evacuation. Open the door, open a window, just in case. Um, if it could also be extinguisher, it's a fire. That's if you have time and you have the bandwidth. It's not a priority. Your priority is getting on the ground. F, final checklist. You basically do everything you just did except you're shutting everything down. You're turning off the fuel, you're pulling out the mixture to cut off the engine. Uh, carb heat, you can turn it back off because it doesn't matter at this point. Um, mags, turn them off. Master, if you've got the flaps in that you need and you've talked to ATC all that you can, turn it off. And now you're just flying the plane and you're flying it all the way down to the field or the airport or the road that you're landing on. And the door's already open. But ultimately, you can't emphasize this enough, your priority is flying the airplane. Best glide, don't put flaps in unless your landing is assured. If you have to, know, if you have to do a no-flap landing, then you do a no-flap landing. Um, but knowing to go through that flow, knowing what best glide is in that particular airplane, and knowing how to manage the flight deck in a way that helps you survive, whether it be like if you're with a non-pilot passenger, their responsibility is to not freak out. And that's all you can tell them is like, hey, before you even take off, you have a briefing with them. Like, if anything happens, don't expect anything to, but if anything were to happen today, I will fly the airplane. I will do all I can to make sure that we survive and we land safely. I ask you to not freak out and let me do my job as pilot in command. Um, whenever I fly with my sister, she kind of already has a fear of flying, but she'll fly with me. I just tell her, hey, if I tell you to take off your headset, just take off your headset and don't worry about it. <laughs> because I don't want her to like hear like if I'm declaring an emergency or something, I want her to just not know what's going on. <laughs> just be like, just take, I just tell her, if I tell you to take off your headset, just take it off and just sit there, remain calm. And she's just like, okay, because <laughs> she doesn't want to know. She doesn't want to know what's happening. So I tell the same thing to my mom. I'm like, if, I'm, if anything happens, I'll just tell you to take off your headset, and just sit there and remain calm. Now my dad, he's a pilot, so I'm going to give him stuff to do. I'm going to be like, hey, you talk to ATC. You help me run through a checklist. You help me look for the best place to land. 
bring your passengers into it. That's part of your flight deck management. Know all of the resources at your disposal. If they're a pilot, they can help you with stuff. If they're not a pilot, okay, the, the best they can help you is to sit there and shut up. Um, fine with your CFI. You might not be comfortable in being, being PIC in the case of an emergency. You include that in your briefing with each other before you take off. So let them know if anything happens, if there's any anomalies while we're flying today, it's your controls. Um, I'll help you with the checklist. You know, whatever responsibilities you're comfortable splitting with you and your CFI, then you do that. Um, with students that are comfortable on the radio, I'll be like, okay, it'll be my controls, you'll do the radios. Like, okay, that way I can focus on just flying the plane and then they can make the made and made and made a call, all of that, or they can help me run through a checklist, if anything. Um, but you do need to establish who is PIT, who is flying the plane in an emergency. Um, by the time you're like preparing for your check ride, it really, like you should be at the point where you're comfortable to stay in command of the plane, because if you're not comfortable, then you're not ready for your check ride. So, cause like I have people who like, we're talking about getting ready for their check ride and then we're kind of going over like, oh, what would you brief the examiner on? And they'll be like, okay, well, if it's an emergency, then I'm gonna give the aircraft control to the examiner. And I'm like, nope. They're an observer in theory. Obviously, if something were to actually happen, they would jump in as a pilot. But if you're not comfortable being PIC in the case of an emergency, then you shouldn't be doing your check ride. Because the whole point of all of this preparation is for the what ifs. So what if something does happen? You should be comfortable staying in control of the airplane and having the examiner help you in another way. Because if, I don't know, if I was an examiner and the student, the candidate was like, you'll be in control of an emergency, I'm gonna be like, okay, the check ride's over. Because if you're not comfortable in an engine failure, then you're not ready to be a private pilot and go off on your own. So you have to develop that confidence, that PIC mindset, you work on that with your CFI and you get so proficient and so comfortable doing these emergencies that by the time you do take your check ride, you're just like, yeah, I'm gonna stay in control because I'm comfortable and I'm confident and in my head, I've already passed this check ride and I know I'm ready to become a private pilot and be on my own. But that being said, you have flight deck management. So your examiner, yes, is an observer, but they're, they're a pilot. You know they're a pilot. They're just acting like an observer, acting like they're not there but you wanna bring them in and be like, okay, talking to you as a pilot here, if something were to happen, I'll stay in the controls. Um, can, I, can I depend on you as a crew member in the case of an actual emergency? And they should be like, absolutely. If something were to actually happen, yeah, they better be jumping in and helping because they're a pilot too. That's my tangent. Um, Covid briefing on the ACS. Um, use of an emergency auto land system. We don't have that, so we're not going to talk about it. Um, emergencies over mountainous terrain. Okay, personal minimum. I don't fly over mountains at night. I can, can't see anything. So the best is like the best decision making happens before you even take off. So for me, no mountains overnight or no flying over mountains at night. And if I'm gonna fly over mountains, I need to be able, I need to be in an airplane that could be at least 2,000 feet above the highest mountain in that range. You, you should not be flying over mountains at like 500 feet above, that's just silly. So at least 2,000 feet. If the plane can't do it, guess I'm not going or I need to figure out a different route that takes me over lower terrain. So that's the decision making um, in terms of like, well, what if you're flying over mountains and you have an engine failure, like what are you gonna do? Mountains have valleys, valleys are an option. When you're selecting your route, if it's over mountainous terrain, usually there's like a freeway or a highway going through those mountains, fly over that. Your trip will be longer, your route will be longer, you'll burn more fuel, okay, account for that. So if I'm going over to Lake Tahoe, for example, the route I would take, I'd probably, it looks like it has Auburn. So 
So here's Auburn. Oh, hello. take this into account that, hey, you're going to have to circumnavigate around that TFR. So, I mean, like, what you could do is I would just drag this route somewhere over here. Still be the same gliding distance of the freeway, but not in the TFR. So, like, let's just drag it right here. And then we'll just add this random point. That way I'm still close enough to the freeway, but I'm not going to hit the TFR. So there's Chucky. And here's Tahoe. So it just depends on if you're going to South Lake Tahoe. Um, if I were to go to Reno, I would just go from Truckee all the way up to Reno, but I would follow the freeway. Once you're down, if you're going to South Lake Tahoe, what you could do is you could I feel like at this point I would just fly over the water because obviously the water is going to be flatter than the mountains. But here's how I would go. I thought I would just follow I-80 the whole way. Because then that way I have at least one landing spot available and I'm also using different airports for checkpoints. So if I were to lose an airport somewhere like around Donner Pass, in theory, maybe I could make Truckee. If I were to just go direct, then where am I going to land if I needed to? I got Georgetown, but that's about it. And then you just have all this a bunch of terrain, and you have the desolation wilderness area, whatever that means. You don't have the backup plan here. And you could also go down the south route. You could follow 50 as well. That's actually a little bit more direct, so maybe you can go that way instead. I know this sounds pessimistic, but would you, when you're planning a flight, would you pick out, you know, like you were saying, fly over I-80? Mm -hmm. Would you look for all the possible emergency landing spots on I, the way in case? I, it's, impo it's, it's hard to be like, because I, what I would do is I would look at it from an aerial map, but it's still kind of hard to get a full picture of like what are some landing spots. Because it's kind of hard to tell like well, what valleys could I land in if I needed to. But it is useful to at least look at it like this and just kind of get a vague idea of what the terrain is like. Um, in terms of like emergency landing spots, it's hard to do that on a chart because. It could say like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of open fields here. They could all be rice fields, which are not great options, or they could be vineyards, which aren't great options. So it's hard to select very specific landing points unless they're an airport or a freeway. But you can try looking at it like this to try to get a vague idea maybe. But you could go from Auburn to Placerville, Follow 50 all the way up to Lake Tahoe. Yeah, it's going to be longer. It's going to take more fuel. But as long as you account for that, I'd rather have a backup plan the entire way than go direct and be like, well, gee, I, hope, I sure hope nothing happens. I 
I use Tahoe as an example because Tahoe is not a far flight and a lot of people want to go to Tahoe. Um, I've talked about this before, I'm going to say it again. I would not take a 150 to Tahoe. It won't do it. So, especially in the summertime with this heat, it's not making it. So, no one's going to Tahoe on 150. A 172 will barely get you there, so. Just can't emphasize that enough. Um, is there any airport that you guys have looked at that you want to go to, that you want to look at on here? In terms of routing? Well, you're always talking about Monterey, so. threat is uh, fog because it's right along the coast and it gets foggy very often there. So here's the direct route. Goes all the way down. And there's not really much terrain until the end of the trip. You have the coastal mountains right over here that you have to make it over. They're not that high so it's not like you're gonna need to get 10,000 feet. You need to be at like 6,500 at the lowest. So that's just the direct route. And then here's what I like to do. I can fly for the Sacramento Executive because then I don't get to follow I-80 all the way down. And I have an airport there, I have an airport there, I have an airport there, I'm flying over an airport. And then we'll go down to Modesto, and then, hold on, distance all the way down. So here we have Modesto to Monterey. You still have these mountains, not a whole lot of places to go. So you can go down to Los Banos. And then from here, you're, you're going to be within gliding distance as long as you're high enough of this freeway right here. And then eventually you have Hollister as an option. And then you'll have Salinas. You'll have, I think this is Watson. No, what is this? Marina? Yeah, Marina. And then you have Monterey. So this way you have um, the freeway and then you have all these airports along the way. So obviously it's a lot longer. Well, not a lot, but it's longer than the direct route. However, I have an option everywhere I'm going. That's what I would do. And this is for a VFR trip. If I'm doing IFR, the route will be different. Um, but even when I'm doing IFR stuff, I still want emergency landing spots along the way. So I'll choose an IFR route that keeps me over a freeway somehow. Um, yeah, and it's like, okay, well, it's gonna take me longer to get there. But I, again, the best decision making happens on the ground before you even go. So taking into account, yeah, I'm gonna burn more fuel. And it's gonna take me more time. But if I'm flying with a passenger, I've never had anyone complain about the routing. Cause I'm just like, listen, we're going the long way and here's why. I want, I want to have a spot to go. No matter what happens, if we have an engine failure, I can land somewhere along the route. If I need to do an emergency stop because you have to use the bathroom, all of these airports have a bathroom. So just things like that. Never had anyone complain. So, and even if they did, it's like, okay, well then you're not fine with me because I'm not altering my personal minimums for your comfort or for your like time schedule or whatever it is. So that's, an, that's a way to do it. Um, it also avoids the Bravo airspace, which is nice because that's just busy and chaotic. So those are other factors. It's like the terrain, the airspace, the weather, it gets foggy over on Monterey. So you have to choose when are you going to depart to go to Monterey? And then when are you going to leave Monterey? Well, it has to be some 
time probably in the afternoon because it gets foggy in the morning and then it gets foggy again in the evening. So you want to take that into account too. And that fog rolls in fast. So if if the fog if it's predicted to be IFR at like let's say 6 p.m., I would get out of there by 4 p.m. Because I've seen it happen where the fog rolls in an hour earlier than what it was forecasted to be. So leave at least two hours before the fog is forecasted to be rolling in at that time. Worst case scenario, have an extra day. Like if you're planning a, like a two day trip to Monterey, um, like let's say you wanna leave on Friday, you wanna be back on Sunday. I would probably not plan to go to work on Monday, just in case Sunday gets you get socked in and you can't leave when you were planning to and you, now you have to stay overnight again. Okay, but have that extra day plan for your trip. And if you can't do that, then you might just won't drive, which is not as fun, but if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. Flying offers us a lot of freedom and a lot of options and just something really fun to do. It has to be taken very seriously and it has to be approached with respect and you have to approach it from a, from a mindset of what are the reasons not to go today? For today in particular, it's hot. There's fires everywhere, so it's smoky. And you know, maybe you had a tough work week and you're just tired. Or if you're going during the week, okay, you worked a whole eight hour day. Some people work longer than eight hours and then now you wanna go fly in the evening time. In the evening, your brain works harder, your eyes work harder. You get tired e more e uh, easier. Your circadian rhythm will kick in because it's like, oh, it's nighttime, it's time to go to bed. So you're, like your body starts kind of trying to wind down. All of these are reasons to not go. And you should never feel like you have to compromise your personal minimums for safety for a passenger that just doesn't understand that. You need to explain to them, hey, this is not a scheduled airline departure. This is a general aviation flight that we're doing because it's fun and because I have a pilot's license that I want to use and I want to share this experience with you. However, we should be prepared to either stay an extra night in case the fog rolls in and prevents us from taking off, or we should be prepared to drive you're not cool with that. So, and honestly, no one should argue with it because it's like, most people are kind of already nervous to get into the plane, to a small plane anyway. So if you provide them any reason to be paranoid, they're just like, dude, whatever you say. So you don't, you don't normally run into that problem, but occasionally you will. Especially if you get like a paying passenger, if you get your commercial certificate and all of that. Um, and trying to crush your parents or your family, things like that. Those happen. Question? Yep. No more time. Okay, well, it's 5.55. So, if you have questions related to the presentation or questions related just to your training, it doesn't have to be on topic today. It could be a general question that you it's been burning in your head. What's the point of shutting off the master switch for that engine failure? Part of it is just um, to help, like, if you turn off the master switch, you're cutting off all of the electrical power. So on the off chance there's like an electrical fire, or if there's an engine fire, that it can become an electrical fire because all of the wires are still um, transmitting electricity. And if the fire from the engine breaks through the firewall and it starts getting into the wires, it could make the situation worse. That's the main thing. It's just like, the, well, this could make it worse. Um, yeah, so same thing like with shutting the engine off. Um, if you cut off the fuel flow to the engine, then you shouldn't have a fire, you know? So kind of just a similar concept. You're just trying to prevent a fire and from a bad situation becoming worse. That being said, you know, if you 
want to add flaps in, just remember the flaps need the master switch on. So don't turn the master switch off unless you dropped all your flaps. Like if you needed them for like a short field, like if it's a really short field and you're like, I probably should have flaps in for this, okay, don't turn the master off until you have those all the way down. To restart the engine, you're actually restarting it. You're trying to trying restart to, it. Yeah. And it's not going to, if it stops, it's not going to, and you try different things, it's not going to automatically start. You're actually continuing. Yeah, to, like you would crank yeah. the mag the end, or you'd crank the ignition to the start again. So like in the 150, if the engine quit, um, Make sure the mixture is in the appropriate spot. Probably, you know, most likely full rich if you're trying to start it again. So have it all the way in, because even if it was hot outside, you would still want to have um, the mixture all the way in. So you'd have mixture all the way in. Um, you wouldn't need to prime it most likely, because if you're flying back to back in the 150, you probably don't need to prime it. Um, so what you would do is you'd have mixture all the way in, car piece off. You would turn the mags off and then turn them to all the way to start again to see and if the propeller starts windmilling it'll usually start back up because it's already it's already windmilling just because of the airflow so that'll help it start um so that's how you try to attempt to restart it um, but if it quit you would have the car be on first because maybe it quit because of car vice but if that's not the problem then you can try to restart with the mag There's the only um, rating or certificate that you actually do have to shut off the engine and restart it is your multi-engine. They don't make you do that with single engine stuff for obvious reasons. Because it's like, you're going to shut off a perfectly good engine to try to simulate turning it back on, wherever it doesn't turn back on. So, but with the multi-engine, when you, if you go that far, they, they do actually have you shut off one of the engines. Because you could fly a single engine and land just fine with a twin, uh, you know, as long as you're not too high. Uh, an elevation or density altitude, but um, and then you have to restart it mid-flight. That's the only rating though that they make you do that. Yeah, I can't think of anything else. It's just really multi engine. Yeah, anything else? It seems like you're really off topic, but a while ago we were talking about how like someone like it was like ruled that like if um, like someone pays for half of fuel, but mm -hmm. they but the they chose the destination that wasn't the pilot that's not allowed. Correct. How did that go with that work in the first place? I think what happened. I know that the pilot was reported by somebody. I don't think it was the passenger, but I think it was someone like at the FBO or at like the aircraft rental place. They reported the flight because I think the passenger who chose the destination was laughing about it, and then that person decided to ruin the, all the fun and report them to the FAA and the FAA pursued it. Um, so yeah, it's again, it's not in the regulations, but it is case law that the passenger can't choose a destination. Um, yeah, because, and then they pay half the fuel, because it was like, it was a flight you weren't gonna take, but now you get a cheap flight and you get the hours. That's compensation. Yeah, so if you're going to take people up, make sure you trust them, you know? Um, yeah, good question. Anything else on that one? Um, yeah, so there's going to be a scheduling change just because uh, I think I can confirm July 27th I'm not going to cancel, so that's all good, but I will send an updated schedule just so you guys are aware of the topics. And originally, I think we were gonna have one more lesson and then the review. I'm gonna just get all of the lessons done and save the review for the last day so that we can all have more of like a discussion on the last day and um, do like some check right oral prep. And it'll just be on all the topics between the last review and then the final review that we have. So it'll be like on cross country stuff, which is next week. Next week, the cross country stuff, that is going to be, I don't want to say like it's not going to be fun, but it, it is going to be a lot of information. Um, if you have a VFR sectional chart, bring it. If you don't, that's fine. I will bring one. Um, 
because when you do cross country flight planning, the new ACS allows you to use an electronic flight bag, like for flight, to do all of your flight planning. However, we're gonna go over the paper nav log just in case, just so you don't have to do it by hand. And it's easy once you get the hang of it. It's just a lot of steps. So it's just tedious and it takes some time to like get in the flow of doing it. But once you're in the flow, it's not that hard. It just takes a little bit to get that flow down. So we'll go over it together. And I'm sure you'll go over it again with your CFI when you get to that phase. And then I will also send a video that I send to all students um, of a flight instructor who walks all the way through it. It's like a 45 minute video, but it's really good to have on hand like if you forget one of the steps. Um, so that'll be next week. We're gonna do cross country stuff and um, night operations, so like night flying. Uh, for your 40s thing, let's see. Countries. Let's see video number one, night flying. Video seven, eight, and nine. And twelve. talks more about VORs. I just, for VORs, I just feel like you have to drill it several times to fully understand the concept, and then you have to do it in the plane to be like, oh my god, this makes sense. Um, so yeah, with VORs, if you didn't fully get it today, don't worry. I didn't either, so it took me a while to get a hold of like, how a VOR works. Um, so, you know, don't, don't stress out. Watch the video, look up your own resources, of course, as always, and then, yeah. We'll plan for next week, and I will send a new schedule uh, probably tomorrow with all of the updates. So, cool. Sweet. Have a good rest of your weekend. Um, don't go outside because it's too hot. <laughs> <laughs>